Have you ever heard the lion described as the king of the beasts? Ever heard a person who was particularly brave or courageous described as having the heart of a lion? Or maybe a person who was particularly clever being said to be like a fox? Or a person who's particularly loyal being said to be like a dog? Or if you want to go to the more fantastical, ever heard the story that to approach a unicorn you must be a virgin? Do you ever wonder where these legends came from? Well, they actually came from the encyclopedias of their time, the medieval bestiary. These colorful books, once laboriously copied by hand, full of bright pictures of crazy beasts and accompanying moral stories, were second in popularity only to the Bible in the period between around 1180 and 1300. And they so powerfully affected language and culture that the legends and stories that they created persist today. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Bestiaries were like pictorial encyclopedias that contained entries of animals, plants, and minerals. Some of the entries were real and others were not. There were varied copies of these books because all of them were illuminated by hand. This was long before the creation of the printing press. Bestiaries could include as few as 50 animals or more than 100. Because of the nature of their creation, each was unique, but they tended to follow a certain traditional format. Historians believe the formats for the bestiaries were created from a few different ancient texts. The first source is Physiologus, a Greek text written by an anonymous author sometime in the second century. Physiologus, translated to naturalists, listed animals including Christian allegories for each. Etymologies by Isidore Seville was another source of the bestiaries. This medieval encyclopedia listed and described animals as well as other natural wonders. The scholar also divided the world's creatures into categories that included birds, snakes, land, and sea creatures, divisions that were used in some of the bestiaries that were to come later. Etymologies did not include the Christian allegories of the physiologists, but added greatly to the number of animals in the bestiary listings. Neither work concerned itself with reality or fantasy, but listed dragons alongside regular creatures such as beavers. In the medieval world, the fantastical existed with everyday life. Other ancient authors whose works were used to compile the bestiaries included Herodotus, Pliny the Elder, and Aristotle. Though the most popular versions of the bestiary were written in Latin, the books were translated into languages varied as Armenian, Arabic, Syrian, French, and even the vernacular English. The Latin language was the most popular because the copies were usually completed by religious orders or monks. Some of the bestiaries had wealthy patrons who instructed the art artists compiling the work to include a depiction of the man doing the donations into the illustrated portions. The allegorical stories in the bestiaries were used in sermons and to teach the illiterate public about the wonders of God that were hidden in nature. Since you don't have to be able to read to make an association between a picture and a lesson, the most common of the bestiary animals were used in a variety of everyday objects to remind people of the message. The animals' meanings were simply understood in an almost forgotten code of the medieval ages. The lion, pelican, fox, dragon, unicorn, and more were placed on everything from building materials to hand mirrors, tapestries, and heraldry. Each had their own stories and associations. Some were included for entertainment, while others were allegories for Christianity. For example, the lion traditionally came first, after depictions of Adam naming the animals, in every bestiary. And because of his association with Christ, he was labeled the king of beasts. The bestiary entry with the lion describes its supposed three natures. The first nature, according to the text, is shown in that the lion walks among the heights of the mountains and covers its tracks by sweeping them away with its tail. Because of its secretive nature, the hunters can't find it. The allegorical portion of the text that corresponds to a lion's first nature is that the Christ concealed his divine nature in the same way the lion covered his tracks. Like the hunters could not find the lion, the devil could not find Christ. The second nature of lion is the belief that it sleeps with its eyes open. The allegory attached to this nature is, though Christ the man died on the cross, his divinity was always awake. Finally, the third medieval nature of the lion, similar to the other two, ventures far beyond everyday reality into the realm of the mystical. The story goes, when the lioness births her cubs, they are dead, and she guards over them for three days. Once the third day arrives, the father of her cubs either roars over them or breathes into their faces, and they come to life again. The allegory for this portion of the story is the comparison to the three days Christ spent in the tomb and then returned to life. The nickname Cœur de Lion or Lionheart was used to describe various medieval European monarchs. And now that you know the bestiary allegories of the nature of the lion, you understand that this is more than a title for bravery. 
To medieval audiences, it also meant that the monarch was a defender of Christianity and a defender of the faith. The lion and Jesus Christ were bound inextricably together in the medieval mind. That link was caused by the bestiary. Not all the animals had allegorical stories attached to them. One of the most popular, the Bonacon, had no such traditional story. One of the fantasy-based creatures, historians believe the Bonacon's description was taken from the works of the Roman historian Pliny. The Bonacon was said to have the body and head of a bull, but the mane of a horse. On top of its head, it sported horns so curvy that it couldn't defend itself with them if it was attacked. However, when it turns to run from its foes, it, quote, emits a fart three acres long, described as so hot it scorches whatever it touches. The pictorial representation of the Bonacon shows a bull-like creature pooping all over a hunter. This entry was said to be particularly popular with school-aged children. The eagle, which appears on the Great Seal of the United States, also can be found in the pages of the bestiary. The story goes, the eagle is known for its brilliant eyesight and ability to stare directly into the sun. It can sort its young from other birds' hatchlings by pointing the bird's face at the sun. If it is an eagle, it can stand the brightness of the sun on its face. If it is not, it turns its head away, and so, though its response to the light, the eagle knows it is not one of theirs. The text continues, as an eagle ages, its eyes dim and its feathers become heavy. And when this happens, it flies into the sun and is burned by its heat. Its feathers burn away and the veil is ripped from the eagle's eyes. Then the bird flings itself from the heights into a fountain filled with water. It repeats this process three times and is born again. The allegory attached to the eagle in the bestiary encourages all to raise their thoughts and minds to consider God and, through contemplation, the old will be made young again, like the resurrected eagle. It also compares the eagle viewing the sun as Christ's ability to consider God. Again, encourages the reader to be like Christ and turn his face towards the sun. The Aberdeen bestiary, one of the most famous surviving examples of this type of text, states, The word eagle in the Holy Scriptures signifies sometimes evil spirits, ravishers of souls, sometimes the rulers of this world. Sometimes, in contrast, it signifies either the acute understanding of the saints, or the Lord incarnate flying swiftly over the depths, then sinking once more the heights. The word eagle represents those who lie in ambush for the spirit. The word eagle also symbolizes earthly power. The founders were probably aware of these associations when the eagle was adopted as the emblem of the United States on June 20th, 1782. Historians say the eagle was also chosen as the national bird for its regal appearance and the belief that the bird only lives in the U.S. The fox is described as deceitful and crafty in the bestiary and never running in straight lines. When a fox is hungry, it is said to roll in red dirt and then lay on the ground on its back so that the birds think it is covered in blood and near death. Then, when the, they fly down to investigate and stick their heads in the fox's mouth, the fox eats them. The allegory of the fox is the devil will pretend he is dead until you are close enough to him, at which point he snatches you up in his great maw and devours you. The unicorn is described as similar to a young goat with a single horn and, according to the bestiary, cannot be captured by hunters unless a virgin girl is led to its home in the woods, at which point the unicorn will be captivated by her, emerge, and lay its head in her lap. The allegory of the unicorn is about the single horn on the animal's head, which was said to symbolize the oneness between the Christ and God. Also that Christ was said to be born of a virgin, and in the case of a unicorn, can only be held by a virgin. In the pages of the bestiary, the pelican was said to kill its children, but then raise them from the dead with blood from its own chest. The dragon was said to be a particular foe of the elephant, whom he would trip by tying its legs in knots with its body and then strangling it to death. The elephant, sometimes appearing as a stork with four legs when it was drawn by those who had never heard of such an exotic creature, is described as afraid of mice in the bestiary. It is also described as a chase creature who only re reproduced once in its life. The elephant was also said to sleep by leaning against a tree, and if a hunter cut the tree, it would have the animal at its mercy because it lacked knee joints. Another of the stranger stories from the bestiary is the description of the beaver. The texts say the beaver's testicles were highly sought after for medicine. So if a beaver is being chased, it tears off its own testicles with its teeth and throws them at the hunter following it. And after doing so, if it is chased again, the beaver rises on its hind legs and displays itself to the hunter who bothers it, showing it lacks the prize the hunter is seeking. The Christian allegory of the beaver is any man who turns towards God's command and wishes to live chaste cuts himself off from all vices and all acts of lewdness and tosses them into the devil's face. Then the latter, seeing he has no vices left, departs from him in confusion. 
To the modern mind, bestiaries are wild works of fantasy, but to the medieval mind they were works of learning and contemplation. And we still today have this tendency to try to apply human traits to our understanding of animals when we search for deeper meaning in the fact that our dog meets us by wagging its tail or our cat purrs when it's in our lap. And, and consider for a moment the, the power, the persistence of these stories. More than 700 years after the time of the bestiary, there's a movie coming out just this summer once again portraying lions as the king of the beasts. That reminds us of the power of our stories. It reminds us to choose good stories, stories that deserve to be remembered. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.